All right, let's go through it. I think everyone's pretty much finished that. Um, for the benefit of the video camera, so that the video starts here, this is the problem we did at the beginning of the lecture. Um, and so, uh, as I said, the procedure, those four steps in that flowchart, the first one's largely redundant for this problem because we don't need to do a shear force diagram, any moment diagram, so forth. Um, so we pretty much just start straight at the stress. Uh, we know that for an axial load, stress is just force on area. And for this particular one, because we have a hole, stress needs to take into consideration the stress concentration factor. So, uh, on the, well, I've written our sigma in the x, so if this is our x coordinate, obviously our stress is going to occur maximum at top and bottom of the hole. Um, if you did some sort of little stress element drawn at the top and bottom of the hole, full marks. Um, and then on the left here, I've got my stress concentration factor. Did everyone get KT is about 2.45? Yeah, pretty straightforward. Uh, Q I read as 0.78 with a notch of 6 mils. Is around about there? Yeah? Um, and so that gives us a KF of 2.131. Okay? Uh, our sigma nominal is just force on area, area being the reduced area, subtracting the whole. Um, which is 6250 on 3 or whatever that comes out, 2000 or something rather. And so the resulting stress right here uh, is 4439.58F and that's in pascals, assuming you're newtons, uh, your force is in newtons. So I always write pascals in a little box there just so I don't get to the end and screw it up and accidentally put megapascals and things in the, in the final equation. Yeah. Yeah, so Q, for any fatigue part, that's the one difference that we have for fatigue from now on. We need to use Q. That Q is an indication that different materials are differently sensitive to notches under fatigue. Now, generally speaking, in static loading, it's just a geometric property that everything is the same. But once you're talking about fatigue, a harder material is very... It, it handles fatigue notches differently than... Uh, a softer material. So we need to take that into consideration. It makes sense to us that different materials will fatigue in different ways around stress concentration. Um, so uh, the, make sure that you use that KF rather than the KT for anything fatigue related. Endurance limit, pretty straightforward, 215. Size factor, as we said, axial loading, and in the absence of doing some complicated calculation around how much of the profile is in 95 percentile stress with stress concentration profiles and things. Just use 0.9 for axial loading, it's a lot easier. Um, cold drawn steel, so I read uh, CB as about 0.795. Is that roughly what you guys got? Yep, great. Um, temperature factor, we just make the assumption that we're less than 450. 90% reliability reads straight off the table as 0.897, unless I've read that wrong, which I don't think I have. Um, and miscellaneous, we don't have any miscellaneous, but we write it down just so we remember. Uh, that, that might occur. So, uh, SN modifies to 137.99 megapascals, and then we sub that into, with a factor of safety of 2, into our fully reverse loading value criterion with the von Mises and remembering that sigma is equal to, so von Mises is equal to the square root of the square of sigma when you've only got sigma, so that's just our value of 4 4, etc. Um, and I get 15.54 kilonewtons. Um, and that depends on some of those little table reads that you've had, plus or minus about 0.5 there will be fine, I guess. Cool. Everyone good with that? All right, easy enough. Uh, now, the fully reverse case is pretty straightforward. Um, the, the main difference is being the way that you do stress concentration and the way that we calculate this SN value now. But once you've done it a couple of times, it's pretty much the same forever. And when we do well, so you'll calculate SN and there'll be a couple of different parameters, but it'll be pretty much the same. When we do bolts, you'll calculate SN and there'll be a couple of different parameters around stress concentration on the threads and things. But otherwise, it's pretty much exactly the same. Okay? Um, the place where uh, fatigue gets more complicated is where we don't have the fully reverse case. And that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of today. Right, so let's get some notes up here.
Alright, so now we're talking about fluctuating stress. Everything we talked about so far, the mean of that sinusoidal curve has been on the zero axis. Now we're talking about anything where the mean is not on the zero axis. Alright? Fluctuating stress. So there's lots of examples of where fluctuating stress may occur. Uh, a really obvious one is in a gear tube. So we've got this gear here. Obviously when it's meshing with the other gears, uh, we get bending stress on that gear tube. So the teeth, teeth come into contact with one another and cause bending stress. And that's generally critical at the millet radius there, because stress concentration and you know, whatnot. Um, and so we have a peak when the gear's meshing and nothing, and then a peak when it meshes again. Um, and this is circumstance when we actually talk about gearing. If this is an idling gear where you have a mesh on this side and maybe a mesh on that side, then this might go up and then down and then up and then down. Um, and now that is not a perfect sinusoidal curve, but if we were to approximate that by you know sine wave or whatever, um, that would technically be more critical than this because this is under less loading for the same period. Okay? So what we're going to do until you get a little bit more advanced and start looking at rainflow analyses and things like that where you actually take the strain gauge data and, and analyse that, um, we're going to take whatever we've got and we're going to try and fit a sine curve to it. And in this case, the simple way would just be mean there, amplitude there, and something, you know, Zero and some maximum. Alright, so we need now, remember it's very easy for the fully reversed case because we just took that maximum stress, we said that maximum stress can compares to our SN stress and we just have number to number. Um, now, because we have this alternating stress and it's offset from the axis, you can't just take a single number that represents that curve. Fortunately, we can take two numbers that represent that curve. In, uh, uh, mean stress and an alternating stress. All right, so we have some curve, obviously mean stress is in the centre and the alternating stress is that amplitude of the curve. All right, uh, And we can calculate them from perhaps the maximum and the minimum stress. So if you have a question that says force goes between 200 newtons and you know, 2,000 newtons, then you've got 2,000 max, you've got 200 min, and if you've got max and min you can get mean and amplitude using those equations there, which are a bit small, but effectively mean is just the average between max and min. Makes sense, max and min. Average is just added together and divided by two. And then the amplitude is the max minus the min divided by two. So the range, max minus min, and divide that by two and you get the, the amplitude. Okay? So um, those two equations, you can write them on your equation sheet, you can use them as much as you like, but they're, they're rational equations, they make sense. All right, so if you, don't, if you don't have them written on a page, you can work them out very quickly by drawing a sine curve, writing a number max and min on there and just testing it. And in four seconds, you can have the equations to it um, and make sure that you're using them correctly. All right, and you know, if you mix these up, it's gonna be pretty obvious, right? You're gonna get numbers that don't look right when you actually look at the curve. So use a bit of rational thought, use a bit of good engineering judgment and check in to make sure that when you're calculating A and M, calculating them correctly. This is a simple count, but it's a place where you can screw everything up really quickly. Okay. So, AM, what we've got, if you were to look at the fully reverse case, fully reverse case, sigma max, sigma min, the average of those two is a positive number, plus a minus number is zero, which is our mean, so the equation basically gives us a mean stress of zero. And in terms of the amplitude, you get the max minus minus the min, which is two max, divided by two, which is max, which is our amplitude. So this is just sigma A, and this is sigma M. So it works perfectly for any type of stress combination, right? And so what we need to do is think about how this being offset from that centre axis actually affects our fatigue. And it affects it quite a lot. It, it affects it quite badly, actually. Um, much more than we might actually think. And remember that the criteria that we're using is our RR more bending test. 
So that's the fully reversed case. That's the data point we have to compare to, and that's the data point we have to get back to from whatever stress combination we work out here. Okay? And so that's what the analysis largely does. It takes this different case, works out how much worse it is and what an equivalent uh, fully reversed bending would be, and then uses that for the calculation. Now, this is just a few examples, this is from the textbook, of different fluctuating stress and the point at which that they would fail. And let's think about the far right hand point for a second. If you take a load and you drive it right up to the ultimate tensile strength, how many cycles are you going to get out of it? Probably one, maybe none if you break it straight away. You might get one cycle and that's it. So theoretically, if you got up to ultimate tensile strength and just just a hair's width under that, you'd be able to hold the load there, ideally forever, but you wouldn't be able to fluctuate it at all. Because as soon as you fluctuate it, you hit SUT and you're dead. Yeah? So, the mean, mean is SU or SUT, or as close to it as you want to get, and the amplitude will be zero because we can't fluctuate it at all. Right? Now, over on the left-hand side, you'll remember that if we have the fully reverse case, that means in the middle, and we've got our amplitude there, the fully reverse case, we're able to go between SN and negative SN. That's what we've just been analysing in the last two lectures, right? So, effectively, the, the, the fully reverse case, we have a, a criterion for that as well. And what actually happens is for any combination between these two endpoints, it's a linear relationship that comes back where the higher the mean, the lower the, the allowable amplitude to have the same amount of damage or the same amount of life. Alright, so if you said that this thing was going to fail after a certain amount of time, this is the criteria under which that this would have to live to be equivalent to this, to be equivalent to this and so forth. That's our allowable sort of size of amplitude um, for a particular mean. So look at that for a second, you can see that the, the higher the mean, the less amplitude you have, and so we need to be able to work out where between here and here a particular case actually is. Alright, so you take your stress and let's say, you can even, you know, the example we just did, instead of F being fully reversed, let's think of F going between 1,000 newtons and 2,000 newtons. Alright? You can calculate, if F is 1,000 newtons, you can calculate what the sigma is based on stress concentration and area and so forth. And if F is 2,000 newtons, you can calculate what sigma is based on the same thing. And so now you have sigma max and sigma min. You can calculate sigma A and sigma M. And then all you need to do is work out where on this you are and work out, you know, take a line from this and work out what the equivalent down here is. Now, that's a very complicated thing to do using that table. So what they've done is actually boil that down to a really simple graphic, a simple graph that we can work out a failure criterion on. And that'll, that'll effectively do that projection for us, working out where you sit in relation to what's allowed. And this is it. It's called a constant life fatigue diagram, or AM diagram. Think about A and M for a second. Sigma A, alternating. Sigma M, mean. AM diagram. Okay? And so if you have a value for sigma A and a value for sigma M, you can put a Cartesian point on this curve. Alright? And so it's very much like a, one of those failure criteria. Um, if you're inside the line, you're good. If you're outside the line, you're stuck. Um, and if you're inside the line, you can work out how close to the line you are, and that'll give you a factor of safety. Okay? So these lines, various lines, are our different criteria that people have come up with over, you know, over the years to try and analyse these things effectively. Um, what we find is that these dots here, I probably should, no dots there, dots come, that's largely the fatigue data that we find. That's the profile of failure that we're talking about for you know, just, just to sneak under 10 to the 6. 
Right? So that's the line we're looking at. Some of these other lines have been formulated because they're easier, because they were initial estimates and various other things. So let's talk about each of those. So the first thing we do, we look at this axis, sigma A, so our alternating. Our alternating is always positive. You never get a negative alternating because it's just in each direction. So it would be the same thing again. So you always have positive alternating. But you can have negative mean, right? So we've got the curve here. If I had some sort of curve like this, I could be doing this down here and I have a negative mean. Right? If I've got negative mean, I'm on this side of that axis. And what they've found is that largely the uh, increase in B strength doesn't have a detrimental effect on the actual strength. So you can have a very large compressive mean stress, stress, stress uh, and really you're only limited by the fluctuations still. So everything I said before is completely invalidated in compression. All right. In compression, all you do is make sure you run the SN the exact same way that we've analysed with the fully reversed case up till now. It's just that instead of analysing the whole stress, you just calculate what sigma A is and you compare that to your SN. So that's the equation up there. Sigma A divided by SN has to be less than or equal to 1 on N, which is just the inverse of the equation that you've used so far, except we're using S uh, sigma, sigma A, the alternator. Okay, so when you have compressive mean, the actual mean stress stops having any effect and it's just the alternating stress that's an issue. Okay, is everyone good with that? Um, so when you come up with a problem, make sure that your positive mean, if you're going to be using, say, the Goodman line that I'll talk about in a second, uh, because if it's in the negative mean, it's a trick question and you've got to just make sure you're inside that line. Alright, so this is the Goodman criteria. From here on in, I'll give you these other three criteria, or yeah, other three criteria, but the Goodman criteria is the one we play with. The Goodman criteria is the one that we always use. Uh, and the Goodman criteria is actually this straight line here. So it joins up SN and Sigma, uh, sorry, SUT in a straight line. Now you can see that where I put the data there, the data is technically a curved line, but the straight line is easy to calculate and it's more conservative. All right, so let's think about this in terms of what I was talking about before. If I come up here, a point on this line here is all sigma A and sigma M equals zero. If I look at this, all sigma A, sigma M equals zero, that's basically fully reversed. Okay? So if I travel up here and I calculate my sigma A and sigma M, then that's my criteria and I effectively have a fully reversed case and my equation for that point is a fully reversed equation, which is just the SN divided by sigma A equals M, effectively. Now, if I am in the horizontal plane and I stay on this axis, sigma A equals zero and sigma M equals something up to, let's say this point, SUT, so I've got mean stress, but I have no alternating stress, that's effectively static loading. Yeah? So static loading, you go up to a mean stress and you just stay constant with no amplitude and if it breaks, you hit SUT. All right, so that's, that's the right-hand case of, that's the right-hand case of this one. So where do we get up to? That one. All right, so I've got fully reverse case, I've got my static case, and the straight line between them is effectively doing what these straight lines here are. So if I have some, some point here and I have a sigma A and a sigma M, and that's on the line, then I know that I'm failing. If it's outside, I'm safe inside and on the line, N equals 1. Okay. So it's that combination of A and M as M increases and A decreases. So that's exactly what this one's showing. As M goes up, let's say linearly, A goes down linearly. As M goes up linearly, A goes down linearly. 
Okay, so this curve is reproducing exactly that. It gives us a straight line to compare to rather than those funny looking graphs. Um, but it's effectively just telling us the same thing. Okay, so that's why the Goodman line is very efficient, very useful. The equation to it is this. You just take whatever A you calculate and divide that by the endurance limit. Whatever mean you calculate and divide that by SUT and make sure that's less than or equal to 1 on N. And if N is what you're calculating, you rearrange for it. If sigma is what you're calculating, then you rearrange for it and so forth. Okay. Now, uh, the Gerber line. The Gerber line, again, was a guy who tried to make it a little bit more accurate based on experimental data. And what he ended up with was this equation here, which has a square on the second term. Um, which gives us more accuracy in so much as it lines up with the experimental data a bit better. But by throwing that square in there, it actually makes it much more complicated to rearrange and deal with um, for only a little bit more accuracy. Uh, and so in this particular case, we almost always use Goodman instead um, because Goodman's a little bit more conservative and it's a hell of a lot easier to use. Cool. So that's what the Gerber line is. Uh, Soderbergh was a pretty early estimation that came down here, and I'll talk in a second, but we need to stay under SY as well. So this is SY and SY, so the yield strength. Soderbergh was an early adoption of trying to account for both static failure, so the yield, and the uh, fatigue failure, which is A and M, um, but it's way too conservative for us. Um, you're, you've got way too many cases that are still safe, but you're saying it failed using that line. And then this last equation is the yield. So as I said, we want to stay inside the fatigue characteristics. We don't want to fatigue, but we also don't want to actually yield. Um, and so this is just adding on to this uh, bit of that static failure criterion as well. Because if we've got a fatigue case, we don't want a static failure as, you know, at all. If you have static failure, then the fatigue one's going to be a problem. Static failure means you're in the plastic zone, so potentially you're changing dimensions, and once you change dimensions, things can rotate weirdly or interfere with other bits of machine componentry and all manner of other things. Plus, you've got plastic deformation that causes differences in stress. So, we need to stay under the fatigue criterion and we need to stay under the yield criterion. Um, and so, this line handles that. Um, and so, if you stay anywhere inside this triangle, you're okay. You can do the calculations on it, it's pretty straightforward. Um, the actual criterion itself, if you have A and M, just A divided by SY and magnitude, just in case there's a limit uh, there. So it's the same over this side as that side. M divided by SY, and that's all uh, less than or equal to one on M. All right, so to the left-hand side where you have compressive mean, you do have to apply this U of one as well. Okay, so we need to stay yeah, we just say under SN for compressive and to the right of SY for compressive and we need to stay under the Goodman line and we need to say under the yield line over there on the right for tensile mean stress. And this is what we do, this is exactly what we do. We, uh, for every calculation, now that last part, that last step, Instead of just taking your von Meissi stress and comparing it to SN, now what you need to do is calculate a sigma A and a sigma M value, and you compare it to the Goodman line, and you compare it to the yield line. And uh, both those equations give you N, if N is what you're looking for. N is effectively just the, the distance to the line. So if I have a point halfway between the, the zero point and the line, my N's going to be two. If I have a point on the line, my end's going to be 1. If I have a point outside, it's going to be less than. This is drawn, so if we actually knew n, we could draw all of these lines dividing each of these values by n, and then you just need to stay inside of that to adhere to that. Um, but you know, either way, if you either have n in this equation, or you draw it with n as your dot points, that's fine. We'll have a couple of examples of this so that you can actually have a go. Uh, but those two equations are what we apply instead of the one equation to the failure criteria. And it's always good practice to actually draw that graph because as with everything, if you have a graph and a point on it, you can double check your answer. It's a, it's a point of comparison for you. Cool. Uh, any questions on that?
we will do an example for the rest of this class. Uh, have a five minute break before that though. Alright, so um, we're going to work through a problem. Um, now, a couple of options. One is I use all three parts of the board and then you guys don't get to see this bit. Um, the other is that I use these two. Um, I'm going to do that, but if you find that I'm rubbing stuff out as you're writing, uh, please let me know as soon as that happens and then I'll, I'll start using the three and we'll just have to on that half. So it's a shift board for me. <laughs> Alright, so we're going to do a simple example, but it's actually got some pretty interesting parts to it. And this red pen's garbage, so we want to do a little bit of a second too. The lecture ones are simple because I need to get through it in an hour. Uh, the tutorial ones are more difficult. <laughs> the quizzes are even harder. The quizzes are really hard. Yeah. 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 Okay, so, so what our force looks like is we've got a 3 max, we've got a 0 0.9 min, and it goes like this over time. Um, now obviously that's a rectangle that's just drawn badly. Um, so this is much more like what we'd actually see in a beam like this. All right, fully reversed is pretty pretty uncommon for something like this. What you probably got is perhaps the weight of, you know, if this is a bridge, the weight of a vehicle or something like that going over it. So you might have the initial weight and then the weight of the vehicle after the fact. You guys still not see that painting. All right, our information is the bar is forged. Okay, so we've got SUT is fourteen hundred meg. Um, SY as nine fifty meg, and then we're finding. Thickness 
So that's this H, or we're quite high, you can just about say. Um, for infinite fatigue life, so that's our 10 to the 6 point. Um, I always say infinite life in these questions, and that just means that 10 to the 6 SN value, SN dash. 90% uh, reliability and a factor of safety of 2. Okay. Now, we'll put some assumptions up. Standard ones. Waste is negligible. Uh, material. That's elastic. Genius. And bending. Small, pretty cool. Alright. We'll probably come up with some other assumptions as we go, but those are the main ones that we should pull up almost every problem. Alright, is everyone good on this side? Yeah, sweet. Carry that through just for a second. And if 
if you rearrange that, what you get is 6f on h squared. value for f, and what that means is that if we sub that into here, we can get a maximum and minimum value for stress, and we can get an alternating and mean value of stress. It actually doesn't matter because there's a linear relationship between f and sigma. It doesn't matter if I calculate an alternating and mean value of force, and then calculate an alternating and mean value of stress directly from that, or I can sub my max and min into stress here, and I'll get stress max and min, and then I calculate my alternating and mean value from that. Doesn't matter. It works exactly the same either way. I'm going to do one way, um, and you're welcome to do it the other way just to prove to yourself that you get the same number of four. So, we know F max equals 3000 newtons, and F min equals 900 newtons. Therefore, Fa equals 3000 minus 900 on 2 equals 50. And Fm equals, sorry, I'm just one of on this part. Do you guys see that? Last bit, Fm equals 3000 plus 900 on 2. You know the way to do it. Um, and the value is Alright, so now it's easy just to sub those values into my sigma equation because my sigma equation isn't a sigma max, sigma min, sigma a, sigma m, it isn't an energy equation, it is a sigma equation. So whatever subscript of f I use, that's the subscript of a uh, sigma that I get. Cool? So, thus, sigma a equals sub f a into this and I get 6300 on h squared in Pascal. And sigma m equals 11700.h squared. Again, in pascals. If I had a red pen, I'd put underlines on that, but it doesn't make any sense if you do it in blue. Alright, so I have a and m. I have my critical stress element. If we recall back to the things that we do, once I have a stress element, what I'm now needing to do is potentially calculate von Mises. What's von Mises here? Yeah. So I can just as easily say one y c is equals square root of sigma squared equals sigma somewhere down here. But I don't need to do that. We use one y c at the end, so it's all good. So uh, to do our uh, failure criterion, now I need to do my endurance limit modifying factors and everything like that. So let's let's work through that. There's a couple of dicey bits in it because we have an unknown that we're carrying through in the, the height of that bar. So. We'll talk about it and hopefully use some engineering judgment in a few places. So, here it's looking at SN. SN equals SN dash C A C B C C C D C T. SN dash equals, or is approximately equal to 0.5 SUT. Equal 0.5 times 1400 equals 700 meg. modifying factors and we start with CA as before, size factor 
Alright, so we have a rectangular cross section. So let's say that. X section in bending. So D equals 0 0.808 square root of HB. And just so that we have it here. Our equation to CA was this 1.189 d to the power of minus 0 0.097, and that's bring your root d less than or equal to 8. This one is 8 to d to 250 millimeters.
zero point nine five two. Okay, so if we have a very, very, very small height on that bar, it makes sense that we're getting pretty close to one, remembering that you know our size factor, the smaller it is, the less likely you are to come across a micro floor that's going to cause that fatigue. Alright, so let's go to the other end of the spectrum, let's say 130 mils. It's not double um, our width, but it's you know, it's pretty big. You, you can imagine that you're starting to get to a point where that's a pretty you know, elongated bar. Uh, what's that deep? Anywhere, you know, my results of um, height that I calculated, 
My result might, if I chose 130, my result might was 200, I'd probably come back and calculate it because it's still pretty, pretty close to the number four. Um, we'll have a look at the end anyway, and you'll see that, that we, we won't need to iterate at all. But you know, that's, that's, that's the, the, the way that you can be really, really accurate in it and still save yourself probably more time and more heartache than will be a big mass, mass calculation. All right, CB, service factor. Alright, what do we have? We had forged and FUT equals 1400. Anyone got a table in front of them? Figure 8.13 CB equals, what did you say? 0.25? Yep. 2.5 thereabouts. I think I said 0.3, but uh, 2.5, sorry, 0.23, but yeah, anywhere in that range in terms of reading the table. So, forged, very strong forged material, very susceptible to fatigue failure. We've just lost a quarter of our strength just in service minute. CC, 10th factor. Um, assume, low temple, whatever. CC equals 1.0. No. We're told 90% reliability. What's CD for that?
Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to plot the values divided by the factor of safety. Okay, so the plot, the value for SN that I'm going to plot on here is going to be SN divided by 2, the factor of safety. And then the intercept that I get with the line will be taking that factor of safety into consideration. Okay, so I can just do a straight linear analysis calculating um, the values. And we don't need to worry about calculating it. Alternatively, you could put 125 here and whatever, 1400 or whatever we got down there. Uh, and then when you use the equations, you have to have that one on N and rearrange for N if that's what you need or rearrange that whole equation. So there's a few different ways you can do this. They're all right so long as you, know, you get it right. Um, but I'm going to do it this way. And then I'll probably have an example of the, the other way for you as well. There's, there's so many different ways to skin a cat. Alright, so 125 divided by 2 is going to be 62 point whatever it is. There. So that's SN on N equals, I don't want to do that exactly, what is it? 62 point seven Yeah. Um, and down here. So this point is my SUT. SUT on N equals 700. And what was the yield? It was 9 something up. 9, 950. So that divided by 2 is 475. Sigma 
I divided by sigma m equals 6300 on h squared. That's 1.700 h squared. Okay, cancel that out, which is 0 0.538. And the way the AM diagram works is that you can actually plot the load line going from 0, 0, when, what did we work out? 0, 0 occurs when h is infinite, up to, you know, peak h's, doesn't really matter, and you'll actually plot a line. And that load line has the slope, sigma a divided by sigma m, rise on run, yeah? So if I was to do that, I want a slope of 0.53, so that's technically straight up here like this, but something like that. Scale. We call that the uh, load line, and m equals zero point five three eight. Right. Now we know any h will fall on this line somewhere. The h we're interested in is where that intersects with our value criteria. Because this value here is the absolute maximum stress, which is going to be the absolute minimum allowable H. And so that's pretty easy to do. All we do is work out what intercept on the curve. Now remember that we've already incorporated our factors of safety, so this point is our actual operation point. We don't need to screw around with anything. If we calculate the intercept between this exact line and this exact line, H will be our correct value. If we, if we had actually put 125 there and you know, 1400 there, we'd actually have to incorporate in into this calculation, which just is an extra dimension of pain in the ass that I'm not going to bother with. Um, but that's, that's the reason that I've done it this way. It just makes it easier. As soon as I know what value this, uh, let's say, sigma a is, 50 something, I know what sigma a is, I can calculate h. Likewise, if I, that you know, 50 whatever it was is also 70 whatever it is, and I sub that in here, I should get the same value of h at the same point on that curve, because that's how it works. All right, so I only need to work out what one of the values of that intercept is, sub it into this, and then I get my, my value of h. Okay, let's do that. So this is getting very confusing. Where did I get to? There. Find H at of load line. And good mess. If our load line was down here, it'd hit yield first. And so that would be the point where you'd have to compare to both the Goodman line and the yield line and choose the, the smallest intercept, the smallest value. Now, for this one, we're only going to talk about the Goodman line because our slope is uh, 0.538. Um, now, what's that point? What did I say? One is normally. So that's actually shallower than one. Yeah, so we might actually calculate um, the, the yield line as well. The, the, the rule that I normally use is if your slope is one or above that way, then you don't need to calculate the yield line. You only need to use a good line. If the slope is one or below, at that point you need to use both. Compared to both. Because the yield line is almost always out here. Well, it's not almost all, but it's, it is always out there, and you have only this small little sliver of triangle that you need to worry about that. The criteria that I use is one, it's technically about one and a half, two or thereabouts, but um, if we use one, that's a good rule. It saves you some time in quizzes and things, so long as you write the little statement. Load line, slope, greater than one, therefore, don't need to check the other line. Okay? In this case, we do, but I might not in the interest of time. Alright, can everyone find me an intercept here? Can anyone find me an intercept here? Yeah, 
want to find an intercept then? Yeah? Yep, so... Um, it's almost, almost time, so I'll just do it quickly, but you need to be able to do that. A couple of different ways that we can do it. One is the equation to the load line and the equation to the Goodman line. Alright, so you've got the equation of the Goodman line with the one on end on it and the load line. So load line is sigma A equals 0.5, what did I say, 38? Sigma N, that's the equation to that line. And then you have sigma A on S, what is it, SN, plus sigma M on SUT, in this case equals 1 on N. Two equations to unknowns, you can calculate sigma a and sigma m. Um, that's the kind of the black box way, the way that doesn't need to plot this. The way that if you do plot this, the second way is to just actually, you know, y equals mx plus c and so forth. And you can just take it straight off this. So once again, sigma a is just equal to 0 0.538 sigma m. And if we look at it, the equation to this line, sigma a is the y, the m is rise on run, so that's uh, negative 62.79 on 700, sigma m, and the intercept here is plus 62.79. So y equals mx plus c. Yeah. Two equations, two unknowns, in both cases they will give you exactly the same sigma a. They are the same equations. If you rearrange this equation, you get this equation. Yeah. Um, assuming that you have n's on the phase. Alright, so um, doing that, can you still see here? Yep. Yeah. So choosing one of those and you can convert to yourself. Um, sigma m equals, now I got. Oh, there you go, that's right. Um, so, sigma m is what? Uh, 100 megapascals. And sigma a is what? 53.8 megapascals. There you go. Good. Because I used a different number for, um, for SN in my calculation. So, that's the one that matches up with the notes. Right? Um, and now, what we have, let's, let's say we use sigma a. So sigma a is 53.8 by 10 to the 6, and that equals over here 6300 on h squared, therefore h equals, can we calculate that? 10.82 what? of equivalent H did we choose for that um, CA value? What, what did we choose for CA? About 0.8. Let's look at that table and see roughly what H that relates to. So we're point eight and 10. Let's, let's have a closer estimate than that. And, yeah, it, it, it would have been... Uh, what did we choose? We chose 0.8 and it would have been somewhere in the 100 mil range. So we said it was 100 mil, we found it could be 10 mil. 10 mil is obviously less likely to have a little micro floor, so the value that we used, used of 0.8 was, was very conservative. We could have chosen a less conservative value and maybe got you know, less material. If you care, iterate. Um, but, but I'm happy with that result. All right. And so what you might even say is, at the end there, now, this isn't a size of material that actually exists unless you have a machinist who's going to hate you from then on. Um, so what you probably say is choose a stock size of 12 mil. So it generally comes in two you know, increments of two. You might find 11 mil, but probably not. Um, and note CA estimate was safe. Something along those lines. Cool. 
Alright, is everyone reasonably comfortable with that? We'll, we'll have plenty more opportunity to, to practice, practice different versions of this. Um, but that's, that's largely how the AM diagram works. Um, we'll talk more about it tomorrow. Let's go.